The thing that really then came into being over time, looking at a lot of projects that didn't seem like they were really going to create big change, is we became kind of obsessed on this notion of a lasting change at scale. Because what really fascinated me in the end was this question of how do you create the maximum bang for the donor buck? This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Do you ever have the feeling that your work in the social impact sector is akin to plowing the sea? That is, despite all the time and effort you've put into your particular program or project, the effects are less than expected, or worse, completely disappear in a relatively short time. This was a lament of Rainer Arnold, a pediatrician who, despite having helped countless children around the world and dedicating his life to serving others, felt that his work had not produced lasting change. Upon Dr. Arnold's untimely death in 1993, his family created the Mulago Foundation in his honor. My guest for the 138th episode of the Terms of Reference podcast, Dr. Kevin Starr, who was Rainer's mentee and serves as the managing director of Mulago, has led the foundation in investments that seek to create lasting change at scale. With alumni such as the One Acre Fund, Root Capital, and Sanergy, it's plain to see they understand what it takes to go the distance. I spoke with Kevin in San Francisco. And hey there, before we jump into the podcast, I want to just take a few seconds to remind you that supporting Terms of Reference really does matter. If you love or hate the show, leave me a comment on the blog or on our Facebook page, or just tweet about the episode in your network. It really does help. And if you never want to miss an update, take a second to subscribe to the show for free on iTunes, Google Play, or whatever your favorite podcast feed may be. Thank you. Now on to the show with Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. It's really nice to be here. Where do we find you sitting today? I am in my house on Ocean Beach in San Francisco, looking out at the... uh, the rain in the dark. <laughs> I feel like we, you know, we, we, we seem to have a, a West Coast penchant right now. I feel like you know, the, the last three or four guests we've talked to have been on the, the West Coast of the United States. While I'm here in Bangkok, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm having my first cup of coffee while you're maybe looking at a glass of wine. I don't know. Who knew? We'll see. You are the executive director of the Mulago Foundation. Why don't you just start by telling us how you stumbled into this? Because I feel like your, your bio explains it, but I'd, I'd love for you to tell the story and um, what Mulago does right now. When I was a first-year medical student, I decided to start a a health education project in the Peruvian Andes. And I was directed by advisors at the medical school toward a guy named Reiner Arnhold, who had worked in every major humanitarian crisis in Africa and Asia through the 60s and 70s. And he ended up sort of taking me under his wing, and he became my mentor in all things developing world. And um, he and I worked on a number of things together, but we were, we were in the mountains of Bolivia in 1993, uh, hiking through a bunch of villages with a group of medical students and doctors when he died suddenly of a massive stroke. And in the aftermath of that, I got to know his family, and it turned out that they had been in banking for generations, and they wanted to put a considerable sum into a foundation to carry on some version of of Reiner's work. And they asked me to help out. And so I ended up in this in this world of philanthropy that I knew nothing about, but I just sort of hit the road trying to learn what works. And I just started with looking at what Reiner had done in his own philanthropy in his life and what I knew from him. And he was a pediatrician focused on the well-being of kids, so that was pretty straightforward. But interestingly, one of the things he'd said to me before he died was that he had done a lot of humanitarian work, and he really wanted to focus on things that lasted from here on out. He really felt like in some ways he'd plowed the sea. What what does that mean, plowed the sea? He'd worked really hard, and he had 
done a lot of good, but he hadn't created any lasting change. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. I think that phrase from comes from Simon Bolivar after a bunch of revolutions that didn't seem to him like they accomplished as much as he'd hoped. Mm, okay, sure. <laughs> So anyway, the, the um, so I've had that sort of the well-being of children, the setting of the developing world, the third world we used to call it, and the notion that we wanted to focus on lasting change. And then the other thing that I noted was that in my work with Reiner and in his own work, he was starting to get a broader sense of what contributed to the health of children. So there was starting to be more of a focus on poverty and even on conservation, where it intersected with the well-being of future generations and especially those who live in poverty. So that sort of became the fundamentals of Malago. We were going to focus on what evolved into a focus on the basic needs of the very poor and looking at lasting solutions. And the thing that really then came into being over time, looking at a lot of projects that were, sim were didn't seem like they were really going to create big changes, we became kind of obsessed on this notion of uh, lasting change at scale. Because what really fascinated me in the end was this question of how do you create the maximum bang for the donor buck? Mm -hmm. And that is where you stand today. So this says right on your website here, you know, your obsession is impact. So maybe let's let's start with the story of, is there a success out there where you you can say Mulago contributed to a particular initiative, and you can say here's what we've done, and, and this is you know this is how it's moved and, and has had impact and is sustaining itself. I'm going to go back a little bit and just describe the course and where it took us, and that kind of leads to those sorts of stories. So what I noticed as I saw more and more projects and programs was that things didn't seem to be proactively designed. They often seemed like sort of a collection of accumulated activities that seemed like a good idea at the time. And then Another striking thing was very little seemed to be measured, especially in terms of real impact. And finally, that organizations really weren't run in a business-like way. And as we saw those things, we had an impetus from our chairman to think about some way of having a fellows program, a Reiner Arnhold fellows program. And I didn't know what to do with that mandate until those three things kind of came together for me, and I realized that we had a chance to help people who were leading initiatives think about design for impact at scale, and that is inextricably tied to metrics, and of course, execution is just as important as or sometimes more important than the idea itself. Mm -hmm. So we created a fellows program that eventually morphed into a social entrepreneur program. And that, in turn, became the major on-ramp for our funding portfolio. Here's a good example. So Andrew Yoon runs something called One Acre Fund. When I met Andrew Yoon, he had this, he, I, he, I was at a business plan competition at Stanford. And this young guy gets up, fresh out of Kellogg Business School, and lays out an elegant idea for bundling together the elements of what a farmer needs to make a decent living off of one acre. So the training and inputs on credit and access to markets that's going to allow them to actually make some money off a very small amount of land. And I was kind of looking for that solution. I asked him some tough questions. He answered them gracefully and uh, intelligently. And after 20 minutes of conversation, I invited him to be a fellow with us. Mm. And at that time, he had zero employees and very little, if anything, happening on the ground yet. That was, I think, eight years ago. Yeah, it says he was a fellow in 2006. 
There you go. Ten years ago. So now Andrew is working with 450,000 farming families, doubling their farm incomes in, oh, I think it's six countries now. And so we got to work with Andrew really early on on the idea and the execution. I don't want to take too much credit for it because he's a brilliant social entrepreneur who really built an ex- who built a really extraordinary organization and was able to attract a lot of very smart funders and we've just feel lucky to have participated in the ride but he's kind of our poster child for getting in early and sticking with somebody throughout the process of idea all the way to scale to continue to move down that path is he is one acre now to place where it's it's self-sustaining or is it still it still requires continue investment through the donor community do you do you know that answer oh yeah it does and will always require subsidy nobody's figured out how to help the average one acre farmer without a subsidy okay but so he's just presented a plan where that subsidy that you know that's that's the business proposition saying you know you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck if we do it this way. So far, yeah. Okay. Um, certainly, certainly at that kind of scale. You know, one of the things I love to talk about and what 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 I love to hear from individuals like yourself because you're sitting at this space where you're looking for these ideas. Are there other people you're working with right now, or people that are on the horizon or have graduated from your fellows program that? have really just thought about development or aid in a, in a very different way. Like, one, you know, another example that's off the top of your head where someone just looked at the problem very differently and voila, here they are two, three, five, ten years later. Yeah, here's one of my favorites that, that illustrates a lot of things, including what I hope is kind of the f- uh, one of the future directions that, that funding and aid will go. We had a fellow named Tevis Howard who was... Uh, sort of a boy genius researcher who ends up right out of college doing complicated malaria research on the uh, on the coast of Kenya. And he gets out and about in the region and he realizes that it's one of the poorest regions in Kenya and the people are trying to farm in a big arid sandbox, essentially. And he gets intrigued with that problem, finds it much more compelling over time than the malaria problem. And he starts thinking about what these people could do to earn a decent income. And he hits on the idea of of trees. And the only way that that really works is through uh, sort of a distributed forestry model, which is, is a tough problem. In other words, how do you grow small groves of trees on a broadly distributed set of plots and then harvest and market them successfully. And so none of us really knew at the time whether these trees would grow and survive and whether there was likely to be any viable business model there. And at the same time, you know, if you're really trying to do a forestry play, ultimately it's going to have to attract real money in order to scale. So we and others supported Tevis with grant funding for, I don't know, five, six years before it started to look like you could actually build a decent business out of this. And to the point where it was proven enough that bigger funders willing to uh, do um, debt and equity investments would come in. And so at that point, we launched a for-profit. And, you know, what I find really interesting, if you do some research on your on the Mulago site, that I, I love that it says it's an innovative, plausibly profitable social enterprise. Um, yeah. And that, you know, just as you were explaining, the model looks very – it looks really good. You know, things are looking really, to, to the extent that, you know, they're even saying they've got a million dollars in convertible debt now. You've been able to take that leap where it's like, hmm, well, let's go from grant to nonprofit to social enterprise for profit. And, you know, one of these things, right? So so in the social enterprise world, it's a commercial enterprise for, for, all, for all intents and purposes, right? Yep. And uh, there's that mental model that we have in this world that 
it's just a different way of doing business, but it's still a business. I'm, I'm not sure if I have a question there other than I want to point out and recognize that we're moving towards profitability by doing good for other people. And that's that's an okay thing now. Well, it's an okay thing now, but it's completely exaggerated the extent at which you can pull it off in the population we're focused on. You know, for example, our portfolio is currently about 15% debt and equity and 85% grants, and I suspect it will always be that way. Mm. Because if you're focused on the basic needs of the very poor, there aren't that many uh, market-based solutions that'll work because mostly what they're staring at is massive market failure and government failure. Mm. And so you know, no one's ever going to make money saving the lives of infants in Africa. No one's made money so far ensuring that everyone everywhere gets clean water. Nobody's making a lot of money educating elementary school kids. So most of what we do is going to continue to be focused on scaling up via NGOs and government. Mm, I think that that's a, that's a bold statement. You're, you're flying in the face of, of what a lot of people would like to believe is the future, which is very interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of um, self-congratulatory nonsense going on in the impact investing space, certainly with regard to the very poor. So tell me about that. I had two questions that are sort of that are on the tip of my tongue. One is about how you do funding, but let's save that for later. The thing that struck me is that you're talking about your fellow program and how many of those fellows or some of those fellows ultimately end up cultivating ideas and cultivating organizations that then Milago uh, invests in as well. I know that there are a number of other social entrepreneur incubators, accelerators, funds, etc. out there. Tell me about that community. Are you a part of it? Are you do you, you know, do you consider yourself a part of it? Is it something where you look and you you're a part of a greater community conversation or is, does Mulago say, "Look, we've got a we have a world view. We do it this way. You know, we've seen success and and we're going to keep marching on or how does that work?" Oh, no. There's actually a there's a great community out there and I think we all see each other in a very collegial way. We do what we do, and it's the best we can figure out to do. So, of course, we put it out to others as the best we could figure out, but we're delighted to learn from other people. And there's, you know, there's a lot of great programs like, um, you know, the one that really leaps out is our friends at Draper Richards Kaplan, mm. who take a very similar approach in a lot of ways to ours. And in fact, because these various programs are all have a little bit different focus um, and different value to add, a lot of people participate in more than one of them. You know, we share a lot of fellows with Draper Richards Kaplan. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of our fellows go on to become part of of the Skoll Awardees mm-hmm. and um, you know Pop Tech fellows. Uh, Echoing Green overlapped with mm-hmm. us. Echoing Green overlaps with us. The Unreasonable Institute. I I've taught at all of these, and we get people from them to come talk to our folks. So it's a vibrant ecosystem. So it's, compare that ecosystem to me for me to what I would call a parallel. You know, is there a Venn diagram? I guess is what I'm trying to ask here between this social entrepreneur ecosystem and the ecosystem that we would consider the traditional aid slash development sector. Are they parallel? Do they talk? Or, or is it coming closer together? What's your What's your thought on that? I get calls every once in a while from big aid organizations wanting to talk about innovation. They wanted to do innovation labs and. So they kind of catch the fever from the social entrepreneurship world. They get excited about R&D and innovation and sort of entrepreneurial spirit. And I just tell them, you guys are replication machines. You should let the social entrepreneurship world be your lab, and you should pick up what works, and you should scale it up. It's what you're good at. Mm. That isn't exactly what they want to hear often, but I believe it pretty strongly, and I think there's – I think it's a wonderful, it's a critically important role they can play in making things happen at much bigger scale at high fidelity. It's an extraordinary thing to accomplish. 
so I, I hope that it can sort of evolve into that kind of uh, relationship. But the whole social sector is just so utterly inefficient because it doesn't really function like a market for impact. So it doesn't really sort out these functions very well. Dive a little deeper for that. What functions would you sort out in order for it to be impact focused? You mentioned them at the beginning, right? I mean, measurement is a, is a critical piece that you noticed, you know, and, that, and that's how the fellow program or one of the pieces that led to the fellow program. Are there specific points that you would you would change in the social sector to make it more efficient, make it more beholden to, to measurement? Because this is something we talk about all the time on this podcast and in, in sort of the aid and development world. It's a really big topic. Yeah, I think it's a huge failure of funders like us. Imagine if funders committed to impact, just the notion of impact, and they educated themselves about how to measure and use the measurement of impact, and they made themselves accountable for impact and had good, uh, efficient funding mechanisms that to... to uh, get money to high-impact organizations, everything could change. Mm. I mean, it's basically everything, you know, you can look at the sort of commercial world and every place you think about profit, if you put the word impact in, you can usually find a useful analog for the social sector. That, that, that's your, you sort of take the words right out of my mouth where here in Bangkok, you know, there's there's Seven Elevens everywhere, and I often ask people, you know, if if those Seven Elevens weren't profitable on every street corner, you'd see them disappear pretty quickly. What's the parallel story in 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 the social sector here as well with the social enterprises that we see we see popping up? Well, you can. I mean, the big difference is uh, funders are completely unaccountable for impact. I mean. Have you ever heard of a foundation executive being fired for lack of impact? I don't mm. think – I've never heard of it. I don't think it, it has really happened. And you can have zombie NGOs wandering out in the landscape as long as somebody can raise money. And they can go for years without m much in the way of impact as long as somebody's willing to give them money. Ultimately, this is all driven by the funders, and funders have to get a lot more accountable and a lot smarter. I think they are, by and large. It's a pretty. The trends are really positive. Mm. Do you have it, Do you have it, any Do you have any catalyst that you'd throw on the fire? Is there a Is there a and obviously not like a you know wave your wand and you know everything becomes better, but is there a particular catalyst that you'd put out there a challenge to other executive directors of funds or 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 government agencies beyond just saying, look, be more accountable to impact? Is there a mechanism or, or something like that? Well, it's interesting. There, there isn't yet. I mean, I'm, I'm working with Dean Carlin of Innovations for Poverty Action and on an idea called, uh, through an organization called Impact Matters. And what we're trying to do is, is create a usable impact audit tool that might become as ubiquitous and expected as financial audits. And that is kind of a necessary, if not sufficient, condition to a market for impact. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge to find something that can work for a broad array of interventions and organizations. And the really tough part is that the vast majority of the organizations in the social sector don't have very good evidence of impact. And so it's going to be, you know, it could get kind of ugly before it gets beautiful. Mm. I said earlier that I had two questions and one I wanted to walk down was the social entrepreneur community, which I'm, I love the idea of that community and, and that there's this ecosystem that is not only sharing, but also co-creating. But the second question was you, you're very specific in Mulago about talking about the fact that you give unrestricted funds. You know, this is the holy grail from a, you know, typical aid or development world. Tell me about that choice and why that's important. Well, if you're investing in a company, you don't tell them you only want the, the money to go for trucks. You invest in that company because you think that company can generate profit for you. And we find we operate on the fundamental belief that if 
you don't trust that an organization knows how to use money better than you do, then you shouldn't give them any. And unrestricted funding is what allows them to innovate and to grow. It's really high leverage funding because it fills in the cracks between all the restricted grants. And it's a lot easier. We need to get to know organizations well enough to have confidence in them. But once we have confidence in them, it's a much easier relationship because we're establishing milestones together to follow over time, but we're not trying to track the detailed use of money. Mm. And so it creates a much healthier relationship with the doers. It forces us to do better due diligence up front, but honestly, it's such higher value money for organizations. I don't know why everybody doesn't do it. And it's, it's really interesting. You can go you can be working with a $20 million a year organization, give them a hundred grand a year in unrestricted money and have their full attention. Absolutely. I've, I've seen this, I'm lucky enough to have been in this business for a long time on the much more traditional sort of aid and development side. And that's absolutely the case. I don't know if you're, you're aware of the global humanitarian summit that happened recently a few months ago. And there's something that came out of it called the grand bargain, where one of these things, one of the big emphases is where, Asking governments to say, look, we need those unrestricted funds because that's what allows us to do our jobs better. You know, you you need to put your trust in the fact that we know what we're doing. So tell me about that due diligence process and and how you have that relationship with your fellows and the organizations you fund. Is it is it a regular conversation? Are you a board member? Do you take a managerial role? Is, is it all of the above or none of the above? What we do is we take a... Typically, we create a relationship when they're fellows. So we've worked with them a lot on the design of what they do, on their strategy for taking it forward. We've worked a lot on execution. We've often gotten to know people as they came into the organization. We've been to see them out in the field. And so that develops a healthy relationship going forward where with those we fund, we we create an annual milestones process that focuses on three or four priorities in each of three categories, uh, delivery, impact, and organization building. And that is used to both ensure that we're aligned for our unrestricted funding and have a basis for uh, evaluating whether we should continue funding. And we get out to the field pretty often with all of them we do a quarterly check-in with everybody. And we tell people, you know, we can forgive a lot, but we don't want surprises. Mm. So we expect people to stay in pretty close touch. We don't go on boards because we're involved in far too many organizations and we're a small shop trying to be efficient. Talk to me a little bit about, there's there's one category of, of organizations you fund that you call amplifiers. Yeah. Do you see this as being for lack of a better term, a growth opportunity in, in the in the social sector? where Or is it something new or something that's always been around? I think there's always been organizations that focused on innovations that amplified the impact of other field organizations. So, you know, outfits like, um, you know, Village Reach is a great example. You know, they came up with all these innovations in logistics for vaccination campaigns in Mozambique, and they've ended up now working with all kinds of organizations with their logistics systems tools, and they can improve the supply chains of just about anything. Mm -hmm. And so there's been organizations like that all along, but all these um, revolutions really in technology, I think, make it that much more imperative that you have specialist organizations like this and create a much more fertile field for them. One of the questions I often ask guests here is how the innovations that you see, the new ideas, the social enterprises, how do they become standard operations within funding or a government operation or just sort of society in general? Has there been something that you've seen, you just touched on technology there for a second, over the last 10 years, that has it just been the, a real game changer, a real disruptor, something that you sort of expect from either your fellows or from future fellows where you say this it's a no-brainer, this has to be a part of what you're doing now because otherwise you know, you're just not even, you know, you're not even at the starting line? 
There's not that many things that jump out at me like that. I mean, obviously, the mobile phone changed everything simply because it increased the reach of people. And mobile money, where it works well, like in Kenya, changes everything. And so, of course, it became a question of with people of, do you use mobile to how do you use mobile? It's interesting. I'd have to think about that for a while. But it, it doesn't jump out at me that there's that many things that profound that everybody needs to be thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll probably get off the phone here and think of about 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones, uh, not to lead the, lead the witness here, but where I was going with that question was having analytics on the back end so that, you know, as you're measuring, you're able to not only understand where you're going, but then actually communicate that to others and dive deeper into whatever data set you have or communication technologies. And, in, in, you know, I'm thinking yeah. of if you were to talk to the One Acre Fund 10 years ago, your expectation for how they use mobile would probably be totally different than if they were to show up at the table today. And, and you say, hey, look, how are you connecting these these small hold farmers and how are you connecting them to markets, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, these performance management systems are absolute. I, you know, I guess I was thinking at a little bit different level, but absolutely performance metrics, performance uh, management systems with dashboards and all the things that provide the useful feedback loops, those are absolutely essential. And there are people sharing a lot with each other on what works best for them. And just general information management systems Everybody's starting to understand, again, that they're running businesses. I mean, we treat everything we do like it's a business trying to maximize impact while losing the least amount of money possible. Mm -hmm. And so all of the things you see in successful businesses really need to be the norm in social impact organizations. They're all running a business. They're all trying to deliver a set of activities that create impact while keeping the lights on. We're looking at 2017 here. Uh, We're recording this in late 2016. And this is a conversation I've had for a decade now. What you just said was that, look, if if you're helping people, you still need to run things like a business. When I go to the field, when I work with aid organizations, when I work with development organizations, there's still a very palpable repulsion to being a part of the business community or helping people through business solutions. Do you still see that? Or are you attracting people who essentially are okay with that being part of the psyche in the social entrepreneur sector? When I talk about running like a business, all I mean is you're running an organization according to sound business principles. You could be entirely subsidized. You You don't even have to have a revenue stream to be running like a business. Mm. You just, you have, you could be fully subsidized, providing a service and do it like a business. You've got revenue coming in, you've got activities carried out and impact emerging. And that gets done just like any business would with impact standing in for profit. The truth is that smart social entrepreneurs don't really differentiate that much between a business solution or running an organization like a business. It's the same tools. It's the same approach to efficiencies. Maximizing impact is just like maximizing profit. Mm. Two final questions that I ask every, every interviewee. One is you're a part of the social enterprise sector. You have relationship with lots of other organizations and individuals and obviously your fellows and the people that Mulago funds. Are there other blogs, Twitter feeds, magazines, pieces of, you know, information streams that you pay attention to that you think are essential for others to know about, you know, like your go-to information source? There's a, a journalist, Mark Gunther, who just seems to consistently post really interesting stuff uh, about the world in which I work. And... Um, Another guy, Chris Blattman at the University of Chicago, who's closely affiliated with IPA, Innovations for Poverty Action. I, they jump out at me as two people who I get a lot from. It's a pretty broad, eclectic set of influences for us at Malago. I mean, it's everything from reading good fiction about West Africa to 
the New Yorker to a broad Twitter feed to a constant stream of people in and out of the office who were doing interesting stuff in the field. The last question I have is is one that's a, you're, you're well positioned to answer, but it, it may also seem just sort of like, hey, I do this every day. Is there an innovation or a a solution that's out there that you're really excited to get in as a fellow uh, in Mulago or you're excited to see implemented in the social entrepreneur sector, you know, a shiny new object that you think, wow, this could really, this could really be cool or we'd love to be able to incorporate that, but you haven't quite yet? New technology, new process, new cutting edge thing? You know, it's kind of interesting that you say that because of a, a very conscious position we've taken, which is that we're not the geniuses. And so we don't know what's really going to work next. And we're mostly responsive to what's out there. In other words, we see it as our job is to say, for one, a good idea needs a good organization. So really, we don't deal with anything until somebody has taken it on and is obsessing with making it happen and taking it to scale. So... I end up looking at a lot of ideas, but it's always in the context of somebody who really wants to make that idea a reality. You know, every once in a while, something will come up where I'll hear an idea and I'll think, I hope somebody's doing that. But the truth is, mostly it's we're in, uh, encountering really bright people with really great ideas and evaluating them for their scalability, their likelihood of impact at scale and the ability of the entrepreneur to execute. Mm. Kevin, I really appreciate our conversation today. It's been insightful and um, I think there's, there's a lot of value there for our listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes.